As I was saying, this incredible power allows us to fly. It allows us to stop or prevent death. It allows us to transmute lead into gold. It allows us to leave this world and go to the moon, to Mars, and to the stars beyond. But before I tell you about this secret, I want to tell you a story about smallpox. Smallpox was a horrible disease. It killed hundreds of millions of people. It's between 300 and 500. That's more than all wars in history put together. It's incredible. And yet today, we don't have smallpox. We eradicated it. And how did we do this? We did this with an idea, vaccination. To understand vaccination, one can go through the insights that led up to it. For example, since early on we understood that as people came into contact with things, sometimes they would catch diseases, they would be infected. We also noticed that some diseases could only be caught once. Once you had it, you couldn't get it again. You would get some sort of protection and immunity of sorts. So, putting these two insights together, we figured, well, maybe it might be beneficial to deliberately infect yourself in order to gain that immunity. And thus, inoculation began. So it turns out that smallpox was one of those diseases. We created variolation, this practice that inoculates your arm with smallpox, and that infection is much milder. They got the mortality rate down from 30% which is incredibly high, to 2%. And this practice started as early as the 8th century in India. But it took until the 18th century to get to Europe. That's a thousand years where people in Europe were suffering from this terrifying disease, and yet an idea was out there in the world that could help save millions of lives. So there's a related disease called cowpox, and it affects cows. And it turns out that farmers would also get it sometimes, and in particular milkmaids. But cowpox is a very mild disease compared to smallpox. So there was this interesting bit of folklore in 18th century England that milkmaids would somehow be protected from smallpox. There was, for some reason, milkmaids would not catch it as much. And this led Edward Jenner, which was a scientist and physician at the time, to wonder what if there's some connection between this cowpox that the milkmaids keep getting and smallpox. What if they're somehow getting inoculated? So combining that insight with variolation, a process that he practiced often, he developed a treatment. In a very important experiment, Jenner inoculated a young boy with cowpox. The boy got sick, but then soon healed. Then he attempted to inoculate him with smallpox. Um, cowpox first, then smallpox. But the smallpox didn't take. The boy was now immune. This was an astounding discovery. This was the idea that turned the tide against smallpox. Because now you could be inoculated with a relatively mild disease and, be prevent, and prevent the damage of smallpox, one of the leading causes of death. So Jenner published his findings on vaccination and began the slow process towards the eradication of smallpox. It didn't happen until the 20th century, but it definitely curved that disease. And when you look at all these insights, Variolation already existed for centuries. The milkmaid folklore had been there for a couple centuries as well. All these insights were there. It was just that nobody had connected the dots. <laughs> I wonder how many people could have been saved if somebody had just figured that out earlier. I wonder how history would have been different. Ideas are incredibly fascinating. I want to tell you more about them. They have very interesting properties. For example, ideas build up. So you saw how vaccination was built up from these other insights. Well, 
Take the simple idea of a line, for example. A line, when combined with another line, creates these spaces around it that we call angles. And the line that doesn't cross with the other line becomes a parallel line. Or when two lines do cross and the angles are all the same size, we say that they're per perpendicular. So all these different ideas start building up. And now when you cross three lines, you get triangles, four lines, quadrangles, and so on. And very quickly, just by playing around with a line, you've built up this large set of ideas. These, you're well on your way to rederiving geometry. And geometry is just another idea, a collection of other ideas. And geometry, again, becomes part of an even greater idea, mathematics. This is a massive pyramid of insight that we've been building for millennia. This is a true wonder of the world. Like, forget about Giza. This is astounding. And it's not the only one. Of course, we have many more. We have physics, chemistry, computer science, but it's not just the sciences, the arts as well. These are all pyramids of insight, ideas. That's all they are. Even practical things can be broken down into just the steps you need to understand. But in reality, these ideas kind of overlap. Um, a lot of insights in physics come from math and so on. So there's, very, there's a lot of shared knowledge between these fields. The way that I think about it is that these ideas exist in, these, in this vast space. Imagine just an enormous black space where ideas float around like stars, where every insight from how to use fire, to numbers, to relativity, to how do waltz exist and are connected in various ways. This amazing network of ideas, this graph of knowledge is what I find extremely exciting. Another interesting property about ideas is that they replicate. It means that when I have an idea, I can explain it to you and you will then have that idea. But I don't lose it, we both get it. This makes ideas an incredibly useful resource because they just copy like that. And Richard Dawkins in The Selfish Gene talks about how ideas, replicators, actually evolve in our species. They're very much like genes. They change over time, they succeed, some ideas take hold, some give way. And this, reframing ideas in terms of genetic theory, what Dawkins termed as memetic theory, is just a profound discovery. It reframes how we can think about our knowledge. But that is such an enormous um, thing, it doesn't quite fit in this talk. I just want to give you one insight from that, and that's that ideas don't have to be right to persist. Sometimes wrong ideas went out. In the case of Aristarchus that you see here, this ancient astronomer figured out that the Earth and the planets revolved around the Sun. He created the heliocentric um, model, but his idea did not win. Other philosophers and astronomers did not buy it, and instead they preferred the geocentric model. And this wrong idea won out until Copernicus was able to prove that heliocentric model was correct. But that happened the better part of 2,000 years later. Again, this incredible idea was not used. So the third interesting property that ideas have is that they have a phenotype. A phenotype is a biological term that describes the traits that particular genes have. So for example, hair color or eye color would be the phenotype of a specific gene. But when you apply this to ideas, you start wondering, well, what do ideas cause? When you, when you know things, you start doing things. When I know how to drive, that makes me much more likely to actually drive. If I know how to make fire, I'll probably cook or play with fire. Um, but what this means is that by knowing things, we become much more likely to do things. So ideas drive behavior. In a sense, we are what we know. So 
To borrow another term from biology, if we have a genome for our genes, maybe we have an ideom of our ideas, the, the set of ideas that we currently have in our brains and at one given moment. And if we were able to map this, we might be able to understand how you think, to perhaps even model how you would respond to things. But these, the phenotype of ideas is extremely powerful when you think about it in terms of the species as a whole. We got rid of vaccination, sorry, we got rid of smallpox thanks to vaccination. And we use money because we invented currencies. And we live in countries because we invented the idea of nations. Everything around us is a product of our ideas. My clothes, this stage, this... Everything has been built by what we know. So in a sense, all of our technology is part of the phenotype of ideas. This brings me back to the secret. And these four things were things that 200 years ago would have been thought impossible, the realm of magic. And yet today, we fly in planes, we cure diseases, we figured out atomic theory and figured out how to transmute lead into gold. We've done that. <laughs> Turns out to be not that profitable. But, um, and by the way, right now, this second, there's a robot in Mars driving around. Isn't that incredible? I cannot wait to go there. In fact, we should have TEDx youth at Mars. So, Elon, sign us up. Now, I really think that technology is the triumph of knowledge. That it's sort of an expression of knowledge. And the secret is very simple, and you've probably heard it in the words of Sir Francis Bacon. Knowledge is power, he said. And this is a, an extremely profound statement. It gets thrown around a lot, and I've only made the problem worse by quoting it here, but this is, this is one of the most profound ideas that I've come up across. Every time that I look at it again, I uncover a new layer of meaning. To put it more personally, I really think that by understanding that our power is derived from our knowledge, by understanding how our knowledge develops, our lives change. I mean, it certainly changed my life. I learn a lot more, more now. I go around scouring for knowledge. I, I think a lot about how ideas develop. I wonder about trivial insights that I might have dismissed at one point. And beyond that, I have this incredible confidence because anything that I want to do, I can do. I just need to be able to learn how to do it. I, I think David Deutsch put it better than I. If something isn't forbidden by the laws of physics, then what could possibly prevent us from doing it but knowing how? This has now come to define my life in many ways. I'm obsessed with knowledge, and it has given me a vantage point from which I've seen a really big problem. In our lives, in, in our world, we track certain resources like oil and money and so on, and we know precisely at any one moment how many drops of oil we have or how many dollars are spent in a particular place. But we don't have an equivalent system for knowledge. And yet, knowledge is our most valuable resource. How is it that we don't ha have an understanding of what we as a whole species knows? Or even as an individual, I don't really know what I know. I have some general idea, but sometimes I forget things. And sometimes I don't quite understand things as well as I thought I did. I think that this is a serious problem, because I wonder how many insights are out there waiting to be connected, just like vaccines, that we just haven't seen. Maybe insights that are buried in old research papers could help a problem now. And yet, I wonder how much we would know currently if we only understood our knowledge better. So I think that the answer is in technology. 
And if we look at our past, throughout our evolution, there have been some pivotal technologies that have radically increased our progress, that have accelerated our progress and dramatically changed humanity. Language is one. It allowed us to share ideas. By sharing ideas, we were able to communicate the use of fire, and we were started to have agriculture and trade and so on. Then came writing, and writing allowed us to store ideas in the physical world. That sparked laws and culture and science and the classical civilizations. And then came the printing press. And this idea, this, this technology, made it possible to very cheaply and quickly copy ideas and disseminate them across the world. And this supported the Renaissance, supported the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. And then telecommunications allow us to broadcast ideas across the world. The internet is this amazing, vast, virtual world where we can throw up ideas and retrieve ideas at any one moment with the computers that we have in our pockets. It's an incredible time to live. But all of, these ideas, all of these technologies are information technologies. Because knowledge is encoded into information, of course our knowledge benefited greatly and our ideas were able to propagate in very different ways. But I, I think that it's about time that we start designing technology around how knowledge itself works. I think that if we create knowledge technology specifically, we might see another quantum improvement, another quantum increase in our progress. So this is what I spend my life doing. I, I think about the, I think and develop the types of technologies that will allow us to track our understanding better, that will allow us to learn faster. What if we had technology that allows us to understand what all of humanity knows, what each individual people know, how problems translate to ideas, how entire fields intersect, how the knowledge graph really exists, how to explore it, and perhaps if we had technology like that, we would be able to find those unconnected insights, those disconnected dots, and perhaps connect them that way. And in fact, maybe in the future, we might be able to encode our knowledge in a way that our computers are going to be able to understand our knowledge and permute through the possibilities, permute through all the possible combinations of our ideas, and then say, hey, look, there are all these breakthroughs lying around that you never saw before. So uh, that is what, our colleague, my, what my colleagues and I are spending our time doing, because we think that progress depends on organizing knowledge, on accelerating its dissemination, and assisting its creation. The information age is in full swing at the moment. But I say, let the knowledge age begin. Thank you. <laughs>